Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Successful CSR Activities, Meetings Today Planner Think Tank, presented by Meetings Today. My name is Tyler Davidson. I'm the Vice President and Chief Content Director with Meetings Today, and I'm excited to welcome you all to this webinar, which is one of many that we offer. Our webinars cover a variety of topics, all of which are very important to the meetings industry, so we hope you'll join us for them all. Um, we also offer a number of newsletters in addition, of course, to our monthly magazine, and be sure to check us out on the web at meetingstoday.com. We'd like to begin today with a brief polling question. A pop-up should appear on your screen momentarily. It will read, please enter the number of people watching this event with you, and please make sure to include yourself. And to answer the question, just simply select your response and then click Submit. We'll give you a couple seconds to do that. Thank you. Uh, today's webinar is worth one clock hour of credit in the meeting or event design domains through the CMP application through the Events Industry Council. To receive credit for attending this webinar, you must be present for the full hour. And upon completion of the webinar, you will be taken to the related Meetings Today webinar club page to obtain your credit. We encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time by typing your question in the designated Q&A area and hitting send. Um, we also have a chat function too that I'll describe later. Um, and should you experience any technical difficulties, please send a message in the Q&A or chat area or just call 800-553-8878. So let's uh, quickly review our learning objectives for today's course. During the webinar, you will learn examples of successful CSR programs used by meeting planners, why CSR is becoming an in-demand program element with attendees, how to source and execute a rewarding CSR program, and how to leverage a CSR program for positive brand marketing and attendance building. And today, um, we um, well, before I get to the speakers today, I just thought I'd uh, say this is a new format we're trying out today, so thanks especially for joining us. Um, this all came about uh, during our original CSR webinar on July 10th, um, hosted by Jesse States, who is one of our panelists today. Um, and I actually, during the chat function of that, uh, Joanne and Jelly, another one of our panelists, had the great observation with all these uh, chat com comments coming in, why don't we get together and do a separate uh, round table on this? So we hustled that up and uh, this is the result today. So we hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get into our panelists today. Um, the aforementioned Jesse States, Director of the MPI Academy at MPI. Um, <coughs> excuse me, um, Dr. Aurora Dawn Benton, founder of Astrapo LLC. Um, Chance Thompson, Senior Manager of Sustainability and Public Relations at SMG Salt uh, Palace Convention Center. Uh, Marianne Whittle, Executive Assistant to the GM at Abel Aerospace Services. And as I mentioned before, Joanne Angeli, event and community relations manager with Keenan and Associates. And with that, I'd like to extend a warm welcome and hand things over to today's speakers. Um, let's start off with Jesse States, director of the MPI Academy. Um, thanks for joining us. And, um, you know, you're a real expert at this. You did a great job on the first webinar. Um, why don't you explain, you know, just what is CSR and um, what is MPI doing in this area? Thanks so much. I appreciate that. And welcome back to all of those who joined us. Oh, I guess it was six, six or so weeks ago. I can't believe that it's gone by so quickly for the original webinar that we did and for the idea that we could all come together to share best practices in a more engaging way. And so I want to encourage everyone to, as we go through our stories today, to share your best practices too, to share your experiences with CSR. You can do that in the chat window, but make sure that you uh, go ahead and click all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see what you're sharing. 
but we are all experts in this in some way. When you look at CSR, it's a concept that kind of dates back to the 1960s, where brands and corporations were really starting to take a look at the impacts that they had on the planet and on the people of the planet, and also taking a look at how they could be responsible to those two things while still making a profit. And so when we look at our business overall, you're looking at the impacts that our business has on uh, the environment, on the community, and also on making sure that we are a profitable organization. And the same is true when you drill that down to our meetings and events. So taking a look, for example, at the environmental impact, how are our events impacting uh, the earth itself? And how can we reduce the negative impact and increase the positive impact that our events can have on the environment? So many of us already in our industry have moved past those printed materials. That's probably the first thing that we did once technology enabled us to get rid of all of those printed programs that we used to have, those huge event Bibles that we used to carry around, all of that technology has really enabled us to reduce that significantly. So we're already excelling in that area, but we're also seeing organizations ask about uh, environmental sustainability when it comes to their venues and their hotels. And we're also seeing them adding in clauses to their RFPs and their contracts related to their requests for sustainability at their venues and at their facilities. Uh, we're looking at how we continue to look at signs in unique ways, how much signage we actually need, taking a look at what needs to be created, how much of that can be recycled, how much of it can be upcycled into other materials or into other things that can then be shared or sold by our organizations, uh, really reducing the usage of signs that with very specific information into signs that have very generic information that can be reused, taking a look at how much waste our events create and reducing that as much as possible by using renewable materials or reusable materials, uh, cutting down on the amount of, for example, carpet that we used or we use uh, on our trade show floors, for example. I shared uh, during the last webinar how the Metro Toronto Convention Center for our recent WEC event had a program whereby we could put renewable energy back into the grid based on our own usage for our event and we took advantage of that. So how are you looking at your energy use and whether or not you go ahead and you calculate the transportation opportunities as part of your meeting or event and how those play into whether or not you put a, for example, um, money back into, into the transportation that you're using. So taking a look at at your carbon footprint as well, and whether or not that's something that you as an organization address for your internal staff, for your attendees, for your stakeholders, for your partners. Uh, taking a look and making sure that you're requesting from your vendors uh, audiovisual equipment that is power efficient, uh, looking at your transportation, and again, and, and then we focused in great length last time on food and beverage. And not only how are we making sure that when we have the opportunity, we're donating food and waste, uh, but also that we are reducing our consumption and our ordering based on our attendee needs. So really taking a look at how are we calculating how many of our attendees are actually attending our beverage, our food and beverage events, making sure that if that decreases over the course of the event that we're taking note of that, making sure that we're looking at our portion sizes and we're reducing those so there's less food left, uh, left on the plates and how are we working with our hotels to ensure that they understand the consumption needs of our group. And I think that one of the other panelists may also touch on this as well. It's, it's her, uh, it's a project that she's working on. Uh, that's Aurora. So on the next slide though, we'll also take a look at social programming, which is the other side of, of sustainability. How are we leaving less of a negative impact on the environment and more of a positive impact on the community? Uh, about a year ago, we asked our audience about this and 41% of meeting professionals said that they are seeing more events that are working to do good 
for communities. And, and we're actually seeing a trend in this. It's, it's this events for good. It's really popular right now in marketing events where large organizations and brands are going to host these, these big meetings and events that, that really contribute in large ways to communities. Uh, so this is where we're seeing that increase the most. And of those who said they are seeing an increase in this interest for social initiatives, 22% say that actually social initiatives are a normal part of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's literally part of the planning process. 56% uh, said, you know what, we're putting a little bit more effort into this now. It's taking more effort for us, but it's something that's important for our organizations. And another 22% saying, this is a big effort for us. This is taking up a lot of our energy and time, but we're still doing it because our attendees are demanding it and our companies are asking for it. So what have we done on the MPI side? On this next slide, you'll see some pictures of some of the things that we've done. Uh, and these are some small things and big things. We've experimented with a lot of different ways in which we could activate on community initiatives. We've gone off site to plant trees. We have gone off site to, to paint a school, for example. We've also had a general session where we created hands for, uh, for amputees around the world. So we've taken people off site in small groups, but we've also said, you know what, we're going to design an entire general session and everybody's going to participate. We've also done small things like you can take a portion of your show floor and just create, we took a dress, we bought this dresser at a local thrift store in Indianapolis. We asked attendees to bring mascara and small accessories and the drawers started filling up pretty much immediately. It's got a very small footprint on our show floor, but it had a huge impact on the local community. This was another thing that we did, uh, this, these, this painting here. It's an organization called the International Foundation for Hospital Art basically paint by numbers. It was a great opportunity for our attendees to sit back and maybe reflect on their learnings, but it was also an opportunity where we could create these great murals that could then be donated back to the community. In similar fashion on this next slide, you'll really see some of the other types of opportunities. Uh, here in Dallas, uh, I know a local artist he created a custom mosaic for us for a CSR event. Uh, each of our individual staff members put little tiles and together we created this great mosaic that now hangs on the wall of a charity here uh, in the local community. Um, you'll see some of the gift bags that we created for hospital uh, uh, people who are in hospitals there uh, at the bottom. We also Anytime we partner with someone, we create a pop-up sign that they can then take back to their own organization. So a lot of these charities, nonprofits, NGOs that we work with don't have the money or the time to create signage of their own. Uh, so we create these pop-up signs and then we gift them back to, the, to those groups. So that's just a really quick high level look at some of the things that we're doing. The most important thing that I think we can all do is measure. We, even if we don't do as well as we did last year, making sure that we have benchmarks that we've set for what we want to accomplish, and then making sure that we're measuring how we're doing against those is really, really important. We're not going to know our impact, both positive and negative, on the environment or social issues unless we measure against that, and that's the most important thing I think that we should be talking about. Uh, and then on the social side, we always start our conversations with our local partners with what are you struggling with the most as a community and how can our event help to help to alleviate that struggle, whatever it might be. Uh, that's that's pretty much it. That's what I've got. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Um, very interesting. And I've seen a, a number of these at uh, MPI events and you guys do a great job. Maybe before we uh, go head over to Aurora, maybe um, just as a, you know, like the leading meetings, uh, meeting planner professional uh, association, how do you guys internally determine um, how you're going to do the CSR programs, which ones to select, um, et cetera? What, what are the kind of the, um, is there a team within MPI that kind of handles that? It's, it's the events and the education team that come together. And truly, though, the team itself is our organization partnering with the local community. And like I said, it, it really is the question, um, what are you struggling with and how can we help? So when we went to Toronto this year, they said, you know what? We're really struggling with human trafficking right now as a city. And so we partnered with Tamiya's Cause. 
uh, as well as the Meeting Professionals Against Human Trafficking. We partnered with those two groups. We had Tamia bring a market to WEC where she, she, that organization sold toiletries that were created by and that benefit uh, survivors of human trafficking. And then after our event was over, we connected to Mia's cause with the convention center so that every time a meeting or event comes to the conference center, uh, there is a recommendation that they set aside a small place within their show for to Mia's cause. Excellent. Yeah. And I just have to say, you guys were really spot on with that. And I, I got to interview some of the folks there and thanks for doing that. Um, Let's uh, let's move on to Dr. Aurora Don Benton, uh, founder of Estrapo LLC. Um, thanks for joining us, Aurora. Um, maybe uh, if you could describe what your organization does in the areas of CSR. Yes, thank you so much, and I appreciate the meetings today, team, inviting me to be part of this panel. I love to speak about this topic, so this is fantastic. Thank you, Jesse, for all those beautiful examples to get us started. So I founded Astrapto three years ago. Astrapto means to illuminate in Greek, and my mission is to shed light on social and environmental issues in hospitality events and travel. I work predominantly with suppliers, so you're going to see an example today from a convention center and caterer. I work with convention centers, caterers, hotels, restaurants, um, and predominantly, it, well, actually, exclusively in sustainability. I made a decision when I started my company three years ago that that would be my main focus. And it wasn't easy to get started, but yay, here I am. People are interested in this and really willing to invest in, um, in this uh, topic. So this particular example that I want to share with you comes from the Baltimore Convention Center. And this was a project that I actually ran last year in, in Baltimore, but the, my client was actually World Wildlife Fund because WWF had created a program for food waste reduction in hotels, and they had put out an RFP to have that program expanded in a couple of U.S. cities. So they chose Baltimore and Portland, Oregon was the other, and they just wanted to kind of compare what are the scenarios that uh, we're facing when we go into these different kinds of communities. So I approached a lot of members of the hospitality community there in Baltimore and the convention center was like, bring it on. <laughs> we want it all. And it was so wonderful to work with them. They were wonderful project partners. Um, one of the things that inspired them to want to do this project was as a city and a venue, you're trying to sell a certain image. And so Baltimore, the, the CBB and the, you know, the convention center, they're, all, they're out there in the world trying to sell the image you see on the left. But what a lot of people are experiencing about Baltimore is the image on the right. So they're hearing about the civil unrest and crime and other um, issues that are happening. And so how do you sell a destination when you're trying to present a positive story in light of some of these negative things? And so the team at the Baltimore Convention Center were particularly excited about an opportunity to be able to combat that messaging and bring something beautiful to light. So if you'll go to the next slide, I want to follow up on something Jesse said that is so important, such an important best practice, and that is measurement. When I share this slide, and I speak at a lot of conferences and webinars, and this slide comes up a lot, and everybody's always really excited about this, and what I don't have on this slide is um, we actually normalize this data on a per attendee basis, and it shows that there's an 83% increase in food donation on a per attendee basis and a 73% decrease in food to landfill on a per attendee basis. That's really amazing. Any supplier is like crazy happy to tell a story like that, but you don't get to tell that story if you haven't been measuring your data. And so we went through a lot to figure out how do we categorize different kinds of data? And we're still figuring this out. You know, this is still a new thing. So one of the things I would say, as if you are a supplier or as you're working with your suppliers, be patient for the fact that we're kind of all just figuring out a lot of the details of how do we measure these things. I was with one organization in Denver, a food recovery organization, and they do everything by meals or portions, actually. I think it was by portions. 
but most of the industry is doing food waste in pounds. And so just remember that there may not be a one size fits all or some sort of universal accepted definition of way, the way these things are measured, but just make that effort to begin collecting that data so that you do have a story to tell and you can watch those trends. What's also really important about this data is it reminds us that sometimes the things we are so focused on aren't as um, beneficial as we might think they are. So a lot of times I go into a supplier and they're all excited to share their composting program. But then when I teach them this recovery framework and show them that composting is really low on the list, it starts to change like, oh, well, wait a minute, there's stuff we're composting that we could actually be moving up the hierarchy. And so as you'll see, the composting numbers went down and most organizations be like, oh, that's bad. No, actually that's good because we're putting it into the context of doing better things with that food. Uh, next slide, please. As we began to capture that data and really look at what was going on, we realized that some of the stuff that was being composted, the reason it wasn't being donated is that it's hard to find organizations that wanna come up and pick up a few salads or a few sandwiches. You can get a food bank to bring a refrigerated truck to pick up cases of food. It's very hard to, to dedicate resources to picking up what probably can fit into, you know, one rubber top, right? And so uh, the convention center started using, in this case, they first tried a technology called Means Database, and then eventually they switched over to Meal Connect, which is something that the food bank there is using. But there are other players in the market so I would encourage you to look for solutions to some of the problems that come up because even though throwing away five yogurt parfaits may seem like not much, that's five kids who could have a meal, a breakfast that morning, right? So it does make a difference. Next slide, please. We also looked at the opportunities to reutilize food internally. And so we did that. Uh, we, we kicked off that initiative through this really fun game that really engaged the entire staff and the culinary team especially. And we had them use leftovers from some recent events as well as this is a good time to do a little um, freezer clean out or you know, pantry clean out at the convention center. And so what this ended up doing was shifting the way the Baltimore Convention Center feeds staff uh, moving forward. And so since starting this in June of 2018, they've saved, they've saved nearly 10,000. Well, this slide's actually, this data's three or four weeks old now, so it's probably over 10,000 pounds by now. So it's really, really another exciting way to engage employees on what this whole initiative is about. Next slide. We also found this relationship with a local farmer. They come and pick up feed scraps. We have this whole fun pig vibe going on at the Baltimore Convention Center. And not only does this provide a really um, wonderful food alternative to a local farmer, um, it saves that farmer a lot of money. It also reduces composting for the center. And so they're paying less for hauling fees, which is you know, obviously a triple bottom line uh, across the board. Next slide. Another residual benefit of doing this is when you do this kind of training, it's a great way to bring everyone together. I mean, you, you constantly hear about the labor shortage we have in hospitality right now and how important it is to create culture and an engaging, engaging teams. Focusing on CSR projects is such a great way to check that box. I don't mean to make it sound like it's transactional um, or that that's the reason for doing it, but it certainly doesn't hurt that that's a residual benefit in a time where we really need to be engaging employees through purpose. Uh, next slide. And then there's all this ripple effect. So I go in um, now after the Baltimore, um, after we did that project, I've now been invited into other convention centers around the country and I'm finding all these really cool initiatives that are popping up out of this. And they all relate to sort of a serendipitous thing that happens when you put yourself out there to do, do good. And um, in one case, we had a team connect with a local soap maker and send their coffee grounds out to be made into soap. In another location, we connected with a local school culinary training program for intellectually disabled students. And the founder of the school said he was really looking for opportunities for his students to serve at events and increase their socialization skills. So we enabled that. 
And so it's really amazing how when you do any of these CSR activities, it creates a really beautiful ripple effect. And um, if you'll pop up the next slide, you'll the audience will be able to see where you can download a white paper about what we did in Detroit. And I apologize that I didn't make a slide for this, but just in the spirit of sharing best practices, here are a few key takeaways, and I'll paste these into the chat box. First of all, look for those NGOs. You know, um, Jesse mentioned a great example of that partnering with an NGO. Sometimes they have grant funding or initiatives that you can kind of, like if you're worried about CSR costing something, you may find that they have grants and initiatives that you can sort of piggyback on. I would also say it's important to recognize the importance of starting this conversation in the sales cycle. The earlier you can plan, the better. Um, remember that whole serendipity piece. Um, I, I have such great stories that I could tell you about just because we opened ourselves up to these things, these opportunities we would have never imagined came across our path. And so just be, be open to the possibilities. And then finally, CSR, this goes back to, I think, a statistic that Jesse shared about the effort that it requires. Sometimes I hear about sustainability and CSR, I'll hear this, oh, we tried that once. It's like, oh, did you try an ad campaign only once? <laughs> did you try a new hiring policy only once? No, like anything in business, you have to continuously improve. CSR and sustainability are, are no different. So with that, I will yield the floor and I thank you very much for your time. Wow, thank you, Aurora. That was excellent information. Uh, I really learned a lot from that. Some really innovative uh, programs You really take it to the next level uh, with that. So thank you. Um, let's move on to uh, Chance Thompson, Senior Manager of Sustainability and Public Relations at SMG Salt Palace Convention Center. Thanks for joining us, Chance. Also one of our meetings trendsetters this year. I just thought I'd put that out there. Um, and uh, Chance will sort of uh, describe what they do from, I guess, the, uh, the venue and destination side of the story. Uh, thanks for joining us, Chance. Yeah, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, thanks, Tyler. So, um, yeah, excited to be here to talk a little bit about the, the supplier side of, of this thing, because as we all know, this um, kind of sustainability and, and CSR, um, these components really take a, a level of partnership among all of us to make this happen. And so, um, the, the kind of the structure to give you a little background before we get into some of the, um, the details on what we do is, um, we have a, a bit of a unique model here in Salt Lake, um, where we've got a, what we call our green team, um, our Salt Lake green team for our hospitality, um, kind of sector. And it's, it's based out of the Salt Palace, but it includes representation from some of our key hospitality partners. So. We have Utah Food Services, who is our, uh, our exclusive caterer in the Salt Palace, as well as our other SMG facility in Salt Lake, the Mountain America Exposition Center. And then we have Visit Salt Lake, our CVB Convention Bureau that helps sell the, the destination. And then we also have our preferred AV um, inside of our buildings as well, which is PSAB. And the five of us uh, have partnered together to make this kind of all inclusive, uh, you know, a bit of a one stop shop We're we're looking at um, partnering more and more with the hotels as well. Uh, but a one stop shop on sustainability for for all the, the planners and the, the trade shows that come in. And where it all really started for us was the Apex ASTM certification. So we have attained, uh, obtained five of those here in Salt Lake, which we didn't even know it at the time. We uh, didn't know till the uh, the events industry council reached out to us and said that that was actually the most of any destination in the world and from there that really sparked this kind of really proud energy excitement for all of this and where we put a ton of our effort into was the community impact program um, donation program that we offer out of our building so we take the leftover trade show material and we connect it to our local community organizations. So you can go to the next slide and you'll get a sense of just a few of those. Um, and then it's funny, we're getting to a point where we can't even really fit them all on a, a slide without them being too small, but we're at about a hundred different organizations. And we've designed this really, uh, really amazing system where trade shows can work with us a couple months in advance, sometimes even a year for those clients that really get excited to buy into this. 
and we'll make a plan for what to do with their leftover material. And we always encourage reuse, repurposing on the trade show side, first and foremost, right? Save themselves money, keep some of their materials. But for those things that otherwise our industry has seen traditionally get thrown away, right? Some of the some of the carpets that get thrashed, the the registration materials that have, you know, event specific branding, things like that. But we've really adopted kind of a take everything approach. And so we'll we'll take all the weird set design structures and pieces and things and we will try to find a home for them. And so we can go to the next slide and I think you're gonna see carpet on this next one. So carpet, right? We all know pretty much every big trade show on the exhibit floor is going to have some carpet. A lot of that stuff is uh, reused by decorator partners and a lot of our local uh, Salt Lake exhibitors, uh, services managers and things, they reuse a lot of this stuff, but much of it, they don't have the storage capacity for all of it, or it, it kind of gets beat up. And so we look to, to find a home for it. And these folks here are from a, um, a group called Scale Model Car, which is kind of underneath one of our primary uh, donation partners, which is the Utah Arts Alliance. And I'll come back to them in a minute. But you can see our donations coordinator there, uh, Nick Zakeo with them, smiling, happy, getting a, um, also I think a display case it looks like. So a lot of the kind of the big weird things that sometimes it's cheaper to, to dispose of it uh, instead of ship it because you've got to deconstruct it or package it just the right way and all the crates. You, you all know how difficult managing all this material and the shipping that comes out of these events. So then we can go to the next slide. Another one, um, and I'm carrying this torch for Jeff Chase, uh, formerly of Freeman. He's recently retired, but we work really hard to find homes for signage because our industry for a long time has used non kind of non environmentally friendly or unsustainable signage and a lot of plastics, foam, styrofoam, substrates and things like that. And so first and foremost, we try to donate those things and we've been pretty successful. Um, this uh, gentleman is from a local theater. Uh, and I think, I believe they were doing some sort of kind of two dimensional uh, set uh, design for a play. And so they were constructing all these walls out of the, of the foam core and finding a great home for that. Um, and so that's something that uh, we're really working hard to find better sources for those things to, to find a home to. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is one that has really been an exciting project to get more specific about, uh, about what we've done so we had in 2017 the Flooring American Carpet One trade show. Uh, they're a twice a year show. They do one summer and one winter, I believe. And they were here in the summer of 2017. And they had asked me about doing something with their carpet samples. So if you look at the picture on the upper left there, it's kind of hard to see, but our event staff is in, in our parking garage down in back of house and they're taking all of the sample boards. So you go into Home Depot or Lowe's or something and you're picking out carpet for your home, right? There's all these sample boards. So we tried to figure out a solution for this. And when the client asked me, I kind of laughed. I was like, well, that's one of the, the harder ones that we've had thrown at us. And so I thought, well, maybe artwork. So we reached out to a local artist that had done a duct tape artwork inside of our building and he immediately responds and says, I've actually been looking for something uh, to do a picture mosaic with. So he then followed up that with, how would you feel if I did something around women uh, empowerment, a strong um, social figure in, in history, and uh, that fits really well with our values and beliefs. And so we, we kind of let him go to work and you can see him on the right laying in his, uh, his driveway and he has constructed a, a plaque or a, a mosaic that is made of over 4,000 carpet samples. And we can go to the next slide. And you can see it actually being installed back inside of our building uh, because the artist really wanted it to stand as a living example of what sustainability can mean for events and hopefully inspire some of our attendees, some of our clients that come through and he succeeded in that mission because we've got a lot of artwork around the building and a couple of them have some sustainability elements to them but this one stops people more than any of the others i see people stopping and looking at this all the time so this is called monumental maddie and the woman you see is named martha hughes cannon and she was an early mormon settler in utah in the late 1800s and she was a polygamous wife i think five or six um and she ran for Utah State Senate against her husband, and she won. And so she was the first state senator 
for um, any state in the, the history of the U.S. to be female. Um, and it's, it's just something that has really come to stand as a, a wonderful representation of what true sustainability means. And she was also a big, uh, she was a physician and a big public health advocate. So she had a lot of really positive contributions in a time where public health was, you know, they were facing a lot of really um, difficult health challenges and things back then. So, yeah, there's, there's over 4,000 samples on this, and it will now live in our building forever. Um, and when, the, when this got done, uh, you know, it took probably a year, I would say, because I think it went up in August of 2018, so it was almost exactly a year. The interactions that I had with this client that we weren't planning to see again for, you know, who knows how long, we had such a wonderful connection in building the communication strategy behind this. And they're so inspired by it and they now um, adopt sustainability practices and prioritize it everywhere they go. And so this really shows the value of if they're, and they hadn't really thought about sustainability much as a, um, as an event planning group yet. And they were really excited about the opportunity because they come from the construction industry and there's so much scrap and waste there. And uh, it just really shows the value of uh, uh, really getting into a, a developed partnership and inspiring each other to do something greater than uh, than just just the event, right? Building legacy and adding an, an extra piece. So, what is cool about this, and I don't have any pictures of this next one that I'll mention briefly because I didn't think I'd have the time to cover it, but uh, this really inspired us to think about artwork as a, a really strong home, and we we kind of had already been doing that a little bit. But now we have developed a really strong partnership with the Utah Arts Alliance, and I am going to uh, pop their one of their Instagram pages into the chat so you all can go check it out. They have launched a new exhibit called Dreamscapes, which is inspired by something called Meow Wolf, if anybody's ever heard of that out of Santa Fe. And it is they take our leftover trade show material and they've designed a walking and like visual sensory um, art experience and exhibit. And it is made from over 90% post-consumer content or repurposed content. And uh, over half of that material comes from our donation program. So I'll give you the, the Instagram so you can kind of go check it out and explore it. But that has become a huge community impact opportunity for, for us as a business because they're selling out that exhibit on, on just about the daily here since like March. It's been really, really popular. And so Salt Lake County, who is our uh, our ownership and who I contract with through SMG. Um, and they are, uh, you know, of course, they, they exist to create a better community, create better uh, economic impact and all of that. And so we're being able to take this trade show material and contribute it to a business model that is, uh, is thriving. Um, and this art piece, too, just to wrap up that piece with Chad Farns, who is the artist for this piece, he has used this as a, a really great portfolio piece for himself and actually helped him land a fellowship in Glacier National Park. And uh, it just shows, again, the impact that we can have from doing things a little bit better um, and a little bit more um, kind of holistically as we look at these things. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So why do this? Just going to breeze through these really quick. Um, and, and what kind of is the benefit? So you know, our, our ownership group really cares about this stuff fundamentally. Salt Lake County has great sustainability program and they're actually adding more and more staff around sustainability as well. And we've luckily been able to pass along to them a couple of awards. And so it just reinforces their support for this. So we won the IMAX and ESD Innovation and Sustainability Award last year. And then you can go to the next slide. And then one near and dear to our heart, uh, Utah Green Business of the Year Award, which is our community, our local area. Um, and so and you can see a, a lot of our green team leaders and um, leadership for the hospitality group that I mentioned. Um, and uh, it just shows the, the value of, of that impact. Okay, and then the next slide, and I believe this is my wrap up. Yes, so one of the things that I always tell people, um, you know, uh, and of course, you can always reach out to me for more specific how to on some of this stuff, but is don't be afraid to tell your story and talk about what you're doing. A lot of times when people do this stuff, they will, they just do it because it's the right thing to do and they don't share the messaging. And so we're actually going the opposite way because we believe in um, the power of inspiration and, and showing people these things so that they can jump on board as well, like this webinar. So we are rolling out an internal brand called You Are Here which is inspired by a couple of different things. An old internal value program we had called SOAR, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we actually have the UN coming uh, just here in a couple of days, 
and then an art piece that sits outside of our um, our building. And what it does is really define what sustainability means um, to us and, and um, some support and help from the UN and their, their programming. And it's also very visual. And so we're going to continue to expand our storytelling platform and, uh, and really start driving all these different goals. You can see things through the, the people, planet, and profit lens um, in a very sustainable way. And so kind of leaving that with you is when you do this stuff, um, there's so many resources out there to get you started. And certainly all of the panelists here are available to help um, get you off the ground if you haven't started. But please always remember to tell the story because that's truly how we'll get everybody on this, uh, on this train of corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and into a, a better future. Wow. Thanks, Chance. That's really inspiring. Um, it's a whole new definition to being called to the carpet, I think. A very positive aspect <laughs> on that. <laughs> and uh, before we move on, um, how do you sort of uh, pitch this idea to potential clients? Um, how do you kind of extol the benefits of, uh, of implementing a CSR program when they come to Salt Lake sure. City? Yeah, um, you know, the, and it, it's kind of funny because that's kind of where I ended, so I'll elaborate on that a little bit, too. It's it's a communication strategy. So we have designed and developed a pretty robust uh, storytelling platform for our clients. So we do a sustainability report for uh, for just about every event that comes through the building and really double down on those events that jump on board with us. And we, you know, we do photography and video and we, we showcase the story. And they used to be very kind of spreadsheet oriented and over time we've developed them to become more of a, a marketing and storybook and so they're very visual um, which is why um, kind of tying into this you are here thing will help a ton but we talked to them about hey if if you partner with us on this we will help tell your story and then in addition we will give you something that then you can take and you can go tell your story all on your own um, and so that is really, I think, the, the biggest key to it is, is making sure that you give them a, a tangible benefit back. We, there is also some cost-cutting opportunities, especially when it comes to waste management. Uh, the donation program we offer to them for free, and it helps cut down on some of their recycling and trash hauling charges. So there's some tangible financial pieces there as well. Uh, and then we've also started doing some things like we did a, an Earth Day panel, like a live panel stream with one of our biggest clients, doTERRA. Um, they're a big essential oils company. And we did that uh, on Earth Day and it was a huge boom for them. It was it was kind of halfway or like halfway through the year between their two events. And so it was a great opportunity for us to partner with them. And so, again, I think I think really helping them share their story, demonstrate their values and, and give them something tangible to, to take and run with. Excellent. Thanks, Chance. Really impressive. And, uh, yeah, if uh, all of you out there listening to this, uh, make sure to check out the chat section. It's really exploding with all sorts of great comments. Uh, and um, if you jump in there and want to ask a question, feel free. Um, just make sure that it uh, is sent to all panelists and attendees. Um, and let's move on to Mary Ann Whittle, Executive Assistant um, to the GM at Abel Aerospace Services. Thanks for joining us, Mary Ann. And um, we were talking earlier, and you really have some uh, sort of specific uh, considerations in your industry. So we'll, uh, we'll let you uh, answer that and uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Tyler. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mary Ann, and I work for Able Aerospace Services based out of in the Phoenix area. And I've been in the industry for about 17 years and have noticed a huge uptake in CSR in my career, probably in the last five or six years where I start kind of trickling in. When I came to work for aero, at this company, this uh, aerospace company, one of the very first things they tasked me with, and this was about two years ago, I was sat down and I was told, okay, you've got this CMP and we're not sure what that all does, but we do know that in our industry we need to get out in our community because aerospace has such a huge footprint on our environment, in our world. It, it's something that is a huge concern and something that the aerospace industry is very, very well aware of. So when I got here, of course, my first question is, what are you doing already? And their answer was, well, nothing, but we know we need to do something. So coming into, actually I was a transplant from another state, and coming in and not really having a feel for what worked in this particular area, one of the first things I had to do is, okay, how am I going to partner? So 
I went straight to the source to our employees, and we employ about 460 people, give or take, on our campus. So with my querying of each department and various people who were willing to give me what was near and dear to their hearts, I was able to start working with the local agencies and some national agencies and use that approach to hit the CSR. That subset led me to some very, very cool things that, again, were both nationwide and very local to our area. And our participants or our employees were more than happy to give me that information because they too really wanted to get involved. They just never got to be asked to do that. Some of the few CSR things they were doing were mostly senior leadership teams. So they were doing the Habitat for, Human for Humanity and very small projects that didn't include the employees. So I already had my participant base. That was the easy part. I knew that once I found something, they would run with it. So we kind of started with off-site meetings. And we did very small events. And again, we, we started seeing some ground very early on. So after I finished my query, this took a few months, I started making phone calls. So some of the things that we've done we're going to feature. And the first slide that you're going to see is a picture of some folks at the Phoenix Zoo. The way I got turned on to the Phoenix Zoo is I began, I kind of queried with the, um, the CVB and I talked to the Chamber of Commerce and asked, where is this need? You know, I have all these agencies that our employees and our visitors want to participate in and where is the biggest need? So this particular picture that you're looking at is specific to our summer intern program, which is my program and my position within that is I work with HR to set up the CSR program specific to the interns. So in this case, I called the Phoenix Zoo and they were thrilled because they have, you know, there's a wonderful places where you can look at all the exhibits, but what the general public doesn't see is the back of house. And the back of house for the zoo would be wildlife that isn't necessarily an exhibit. So you're talking birds or small animals. And what you're looking at here is a creek. And if you can see on the picture, all the reeds they're growing up. There is a creek down in there somewhere, but the creek was stagnant. And we needed a group of people who were willing to get dirty and get in there and dig through and pull up all this, this growth in there so that the creek can flow. So when we got there, it was pretty daunting. I'll, I'll be the first to admit we had a big group. Um, what you're seeing in the picture is a very small uh, representation of who we had there. The zoo provided us with buckets, shovels, and saws. And we thought, okay, let's do this. This was actually one of our most favorite projects, as it turns out, in which our, our employees want to do this again. But what we did is by the time we finished clearing out that stream, and it was roughly a quarter mile of stream, that creek was running. We could see the, the birds and the very small creatures coming into the creek that we had already had cleared. By the time we were done, this quarter mile part of creek was freely running. We were muddy. We were dirty. We were tired. But the sense of satisfaction that we got, that the whole group got from giving back in this way was just really immeasurable. So the Phoenix Zoo has since reached out to us because they don't get funding for these things. So your groups, when you're looking to source some kind of CSR, it's amazing where you could find the need because they don't employ people to do this kind of thing. So that was one of our, our very popular activities that we did and we do partner with the zoo quite a bit now. And the benefits to the, the participants, first of all, is they got to know each other. Most of them came from all over the country and didn't know each other. They also had an opportunity to network with managers who participated in this project. And they got to see something pretty cool in Phoenix, Arizona, that's something they've never seen before, which is the back of house of the zoo. So the, one of the other things that we had come up with our CSR is many, many people in our area had stressed that there was a hunger need in our, really in our backyard. And that is something we really have to look at. And the GM had tossed me, okay, Marianne, what can we do about that? So of course, the normal, okay, we can do a canned food drive in conjunction with meetings. So if, in the next slide, what you're going to see is we wanted to do a different take on CSR for, for a food drive. So okay, it's not as cool by any long shot as Monumental Maddie. But what we did is we had tasked the various different departments to come up with a canned food sculpture. It could be anything they wanted. It could be as large as they wanted, but they had to bring in the cans or the employees would bring in the cans to their favorite team that they were rooting for. And they had to come up with a sculpture that was judged by senior leadership. And in this case, what you're seeing is the state of Arizona with a cactus. 
and this was the winning sculpture, but there were many sculptures and they were all very cool. The participants loved it. We got huge, huge participation on this because it wasn't just bring in the cans from your pantry. People were actually going out and bringing cases of food in. By the time we were done, the count was over 3,000 pounds of food that were donated to that food bank. And this is one of the, we, we partner with, we do several things with this food can, uh, bank throughout the year, but this one has been by far one of the most popular ones. And doing it in the summertime had been really beneficial because the food banks don't get that during the summer. All the food drives are usually done around the holidays. Well, in this case, the food bank needed something now. So this is what we came up with, and it was a very, very popular thing to do. Moving into the next slide, um, one of the other organizations that came up is we had a customer that was visiting our facility. And we have a huge campus. And the customer had actually gotten wind that I was handling the CSR for our company. And had stopped by my office and was telling me that he was part of this group called the Arms of Love Foster Care Organization. And what that organization was, or is, is they foster children who don't have homes. So these are kids that might have been picked up from a, from a stress situation or traumatic situation, and they were kind of in limbo, waiting for a placement. So in this case, this was obviously the holidays, and the customer had explained to me that they had over 300 children that were waiting for placement in a foster home. So typically, you know, we do the, the gift drives and everything. But what we did in this case is I reached out to the Arms of Love, and they're not used to too much community support, which was one of the other things that was very critical in this CSR activity that we did. They gave us, without revealing the child's identity, they gave us very specific things that these kids would like. And they were going to have this big holiday party for these children who have no home. Some of them had no clothes. Some of them were needed underwear. And these children were writing that down. They wanted they needed a hairbrush or a toothbrush. So what we did is we put these tags out on that Christmas tree, you see. The tags, we had a, uh, about 300 tags when we first started. They were gone within 12 hours. And what we did is we asked the employees, if you have children, look for uh, tags the same age as your children. And what they did is they took their kids out to pick these gifts out. And we ended up getting the essentials, their underwear, socks, toothbrushes. But we also received, as you see, these toys and we actually got so much that they were able to help children that had come into the program after we had closed our, our program off. So we were able to help somewhere in the neighborhood, I think the agency said about 400 children. And the, our, again, the participation was outrageous. And the more CSR we found ourselves doing, the bigger participation we got. And then the next slide uh, talks about some of the other agencies that I've partnered with, and I try to balance it again based on what our employees asked me to do, what's near and dear to their heart. But what I had found is when I really needed to dig deep, I could go to the Chamber of Commerce or the CVB, and they would give me it, people to contact, so it wasn't just a name. I would have I would have actual people I can go to and say, okay, where is your need? Which led to the Singletons. And the Singletons was brought up by one of our employees who was um, who had a family member who was a client. And what the Singletons is, is that's an agency that nobody would know about because it's not a nationwide agency. But they help families, single parent families, in which the parent or a child had cancer. And these families are already stressed and and having challenges just because of single parent. But to deal with that on top of it was was just one more thing that these families have to cope with. So what we did is we found out, okay, what is your immediate need? And we have employees of all different abilities and all different needs. We have um, some that are wheelchair bound or some that might be recovering from injuries because we, we employ a lot of veterans. So what we did is we got a project where we rolled plastic cutlery, and they provide these plastic cutlery in packages of 20 to families, and they can get them once a month in, included with a food delivery, because cancer patients, and I did not know this, have a problem with the metallic taste, so the plastic cutlery helps them at least enjoy the food a little bit better and get some nutrition. We also included handwritten notes that our employees had written for the families that were attached to every single one of those rolled cutleries as well as a card that went into the box. So we, we really got some personal, personal input in on this project. So this was 
something that we ended up partnering with and we do with visitors as well and our interns enjoyed it as well and it appealed to different people with different abilities who may not want or be able to go to a zoo and dig out a creek. So the goal was to have a lot of different CSR activities that our employees can jump in anytime they want to. The, the company benefits because it, it does let people know out there that this aerospace company cares about what's going on in its own environment and around the world. And I did forget to mention the Boys and Girls Club, which is nationwide and very easy to work with if you're doing a destination meeting. And they love to incorporate the groups with the kids because some of these kids, the, those adult mentors are the only ones they have. And they're very easy to get a hold of and very willing to work with groups even if you've got a limited time or specific time within your agenda where you want to bring a group out, I found that the Boys and Girls Club is one of the easiest to work with because they're so in need of adults to mentor these kids. So those are just some of the programs that we have um, that we do. It is my passion. It's become almost my full-time job. So a lot of my events that I plan and my meetings I plan actually are in partner with our marketing department to allow me to do this research and produce these CSR programs. And again, I can't enforce, as it's been prior, measurement is important. That's how you know what you're doing is working. Excellent. Thank you, Marianne. I appreciate it. And in the interest of time, let's move on to Joanne and Jelly. Uh, this was all her idea. It's been great. Thank you, Joanne. I'll take it away. Hi, everybody. My name is Joanne, and being that we only have about four minutes, I'm going to talk extra fast for you all today. Um, I was going to tell you a little bit about how the concept of CSR got started here at Keenan. In 2012, we had, when I joined the company, we had an annual meeting that was the stereotypical, um, what I call dog and pony show with our CEO and CFO getting up on stage and presenting. And to be honest, it was really kind of routine and boring. Um, my background is in nonprofit and corporate event planning. So the following year, I introduced to our CEO the idea of putting together some sort of a CSR project in conjunction with the annual meeting. I had an idea of doing a variety of different projects at this meeting, and they all thought I was a little crazy. Um, the meeting that normally happened was about 150 people, strictly management team. Um, I'm lucky for me, we were able to pull it off. And when the management team came back to the office, they were talking about it uh, to their staff. And uh, comments were going back and forth. And the next thing I know, my CEO called me and my boss into his office and asked us if we could replicate the CSR initiative for the whole company. We have about 750 people, 550 which are in uh, Southern California, and another 200 or so up north. Um, we actually did it. We were able to do it, and we've been doing it ever since. We have since renamed our annual meeting the Annual Meeting Slash Impact Day. And it begins with the stereotypical CEO, CFO presentation up on stage. But in the afternoon, we, we toss it to impact day and we spend about three hours doing a variety of activities. It's become kind of like a family reunion where everybody gets together for a common cause. We work on a variety of projects. We have a lot of fun doing it. I'm going to tell you a couple of the things that we've done. We've done anything from making brown bag lunches to, uh, for the homeless stuffing teddy bears, to making no-sew blankets, and assembling backpacks. Some of the um, slides you'll be seeing are just photos from some of these days. And each year you'll notice our, our t-shirt changes. It always says Keenan Impact in the front, and on the back of it there's always a different saying that has something to do with making an impact in the community. We've made stress balls from balloons and flour. Uh, I have to be honest with you, that was one of the messiest um, and I didn't have a picture of that one, but one of the most fun projects we ever did. Our management team was completely covered in flour by the end of the day. We've built playhouses for Habitat for Humanity. We've made dog and cat toys for the local animal shelters, painted school fences and murals. We've helped plant school gardens. We've wrapped toys for children in shelters, collected sorted clothing for needy, decorated superhero capes and hats for kids in the hospitals. We've assembled bikes and scooters, packaged up the equivalent of, I think this one's amazing, 200,000 individual meals for an organization called Feeding Children Everywhere. We try really hard not to do the same activity twice. We also invite the nonprofit partners to come and speak during the first part of our meeting so that they can um, get a chance to tell, about, tell their story to our staff, and then they spend the afternoon with us. They get to learn about Keenan, our culture, our, our staff, and the staff gets to know them a little bit more too. Since 2012, the CSR program has expanded. We now offer employees a two days off of volunteer time so that they can go and spend time at their, their uh, nonprofit of choice. We offer a group VTO opportunities, volunteer time off opportunities, where we physically plan things that attendees can attend, excuse me, that our staff can attend. 
We have a CSR committee that's comprised of 25 volunteers throughout the state of California. We plan back to school drives, food drives, furry friend drives, otherwise known as animal food drives. Um, we have a monthly online newsletter that lists upcoming volunteer opportunities. We share stories about recent CSR activities that we've been doing. We highlight folks that we call weekend warriors. Um, those are the folks that do volunteer activities on their own time. We host a volunteer fair, lunch and learns throughout the year at all of our offices. We even incorporate CSR activities at our trade shows that we attend. And we invite the conference attendees to participate along with us. We've actually become known for this now at several of the shows that we go to and people stop by just to see what we're gonna be doing this year. And they'll come by and say, were you guys the guys that did the stuffing the teddy bears last year? Or did you guys do the homeless kids last year? It's like, yep. And we probably do a thousand or more of whatever our project is at these trade shows. And we also uh, non um, partner with the local nonprofits. And for the past three years, we've led what we like to call our mini impact day at a local um, junior high school in Anaheim as part of their Martin Luther King service day. Um, so again, I've done this extremely quickly because I'm watching the time. Um, that's what Keenan does. I wanted to say thank you to, to um, meetings today and Tyler and Jesse for allowing me to be part of the panel. I got some great ideas. I've been scribbling notes like crazy. Um, I'm going to be calling everybody and I just want to say thank you to all of you who work in the CSR area and for all the, um, the, the good that you do in your local communities. I'm done, Tyler. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I'll be compiling uh, some of these chat uh, questions and observations that come come in, and and uh, we're going to skip the Q and A session in the interest of time. But uh, please, if any of you out there have any questions, just send them to me at uh, Tyler Davidson at meetingstoday.com, and I'm going to follow up and probably do a story on this, et cetera. Um, so uh, as I said, though, uh, we should uh, move along. Um, and close it out. And um, as we close out the presentation, there's just a few important pieces of information we'd like to share. On August 28th at 1 Eastern, um, we have another webinar, Don't Get Skinned, Critical Clauses and Other Meetings con Contract Tips with uh, Kelly Bognall. And we hope you can join us for that. And also on your our website, you'll find a vault of information on past webinars available for you to view at any time at your convenience. And upon completion of the webinar, you will be redirected to today's related webinar club page. Each webinar has its own webinar club page where you can download the presentation, view the webinar on demand, obtain your CMP credit certificate, and so much more. Today's webinar club page is located at meetingstoday.com forward slash webinar club CSR. And if you're not automatically redirected, you may also visit our website, meetingstoday.com and just hover over the webinars tab in the navigation area and click on the webinar club in the drop down menu. Um, once again, thanks again to uh, Jesse and Joanne and all of the panelists. Wow, from tremendous information. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this webinar today. Have a great rest of the day and we hope to see you again soon.